Cycles, reproduction in plants. Types of reproduction in plants. First, we have sexual reproduction for flowering plants. This involves the fusion of a male nucleus with the female nucleus. These plants reproduce from seeds. Second, we have asexual reproduction for non flowering plants and fungi. For this method of reproduction, fertilization doesn't occur. Only one parent plant is involved. The offsprings are genetically identical to the parent. Fungi reproduce asexually from spores. We will now explore how reproduction occurs in flowering plants in detail. Importance of reproduction Reproduction is important, as it ensures that species of its own kind will not become extinct. Parts of a flower Let's look at the male parts of a flower. It consists of the anther and filament, together they are known as the stamen. The anther contains pollen sacs, which produces pollen grains. Pollen grains functions to fertilize the egg. The filament supports the anther and holds it in a prominent position. Let's look at the female parts of a flower. It contains the stigma, style, ovary, and ovule. Together they make up the pistil. The stigma functions to receive pollen grains. The style functions to connect the stigma to the ovary. The ovary contains undeveloped seeds, also known as ovule. The ovule contains female sex cells, which are also called eggs. Types of flowers Bisexual flowers These flowers have both stamen and pistil on the same flower, for example, lilies. Unisexual flowers These types of flowers are found on plants that have stamen or pistil in different flowers. The male and female flowers are either found on the same plant, or the plant has all male or female flowers. Reproduction from seeds Most flowering plants reproduce from seeds, and for reproduction to occur the following must happen. First, pollination. Second, fertilization. Third, dispersal. And lastly, germination. We will look at each stage in detail. The first stage, pollination. Pollination is the transfer of pollen grains from the anther to the stigma of the flower. There are two types of pollination. Self-pollination. It is the transfer of pollen grains from the anther of the same flower to the stigma of the same flower. Or, it is the transfer of pollen grains from the anther of a flower to the stigma of another flower of the same plant. Cross-pollination. It is the transfer of pollen grains from the anther of a flower to the stigma of another flower on a different plant. Agents of pollination. It refers to those who help to carry out the process of pollination. This includes wind and animals. Let's look at some characteristics of flowers that are pollinated by wind. The pollen grains of these flowers are small, light, and can be easily blown from anthers and carries by the wind. These plants have small, dull-colored, and unscented flowers. Wind pollinated flowers produce a lot of pollen grains due to the uncertainty of where the wind will carry the pollen grains to. These flowers have dangling anthers, catching wind easily for the transport of pollen grains. Lastly, these flowers have large and feathery stigma, increasing the likelihood of pollen grains being captured. Now, we will look at some characteristics of flowers pollinated by animals. Pollen grains of such flowers have hooks or spikes that clings onto animals' body or legs. The pollen grains are then brushed off and lands on the stigma of another flower the animal visits. These insects visit the flowers to eat nectar stored at the base of the plants or to eat the pollen grains which are nutritious. These flowers also have colorful petals or are strongly scented, which attract insects to them. Some flowers have special markings or patterns on flower petals, also known as honey guide, which leads insect to the nectar. Lastly, these flowers produce their sweetest and strongest scent when the pollen grains are ready for pollination. Fertilization It occurs when the male sex cell from the pollen grain fuses with the ovule. The pollen grains landed on the stigma. The pollen grain secretes chemicals and grows a tube to release the male sex cell which fuses with the ovule. After fertilization, the petals will start to wither and eventually fall. The ovary begins to swell to form a fruit wall, which develops to become a fruit. The ovules develop into seeds. 
dispersal. It prevents overcrowding by allowing seeds to be scattered to new habitats, where conditions may be more suitable for growth and reproduction. Without dispersal, seeds would fall onto the ground directly, below the parent plant, and chances of survival becomes minimal. Thousands of young plants will grow and compete for resources, such as sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide. There are four methods of dispersal which we will take a look at in detail. They are by animals, by wind, by water, by splitting mechanism, which can either be explosive or non explosive. Dispersal by animals. Seeds that are dispersed by this method are those that are large and inedible, which are thrown away by man and animals. Some tiny seeds that are swallowed passes through undamaged in the animal's digestive system and are scattered with animal feces. Some fruits have hooks, spikes, stiff hairs, or sticky surfaces that clings onto animals' fur or human clothing. Dispersal by wind. These seeds are dry, light, and have hairs. These seeds also have wind-like structure. Dispersal by water. The fruit and seed have fibrous husk that traps air, allowing the fruit to float in water. Dispersal by splitting mechanism. When the fruit ripens, they split open with an explosive action to release seeds in various direction. An example would be rubber, which splits open with a cracking sound. When the fruit is ready to release its seed, it splits open to allow wind to carry its seeds away. An example would be cotton. Now, let's look at the last stage, germination. Germination refers to the growth of a seed into a young plant. Germination occurs only when there is water, oxygen, and warmth. Germination doesn't require sunlight. This is because the seed cannot undergo photosynthesis and instead obtains food from its seed leaves. During germination, the roots appear first and grows towards water. The shoot appears next and grows towards sunlight. Afterwards, the first pair of leaves unfold. Lastly, photosynthesis begins. Now, let's explore how reproduction occurs in non flowering plants and fungi in detail. Now, we will look at mushrooms, which are fungi. Most fungi have stalk and cap, and some have gills. The cap works as an umbrella to ensure that the gills remain dry. Spores are found in between these gills. When the spores are ripe, the gills open, and spores are released into the air. Reproduction using spores. Non flowering plants can be classified into green and non green plants, and they all reproduce from spores. Spores are tiny spherical cells that can be seen under the microscope. You can see the spores here. It is dispersed by wind, as it is light and small. A common example of a green, non flowering plant is ferns. They have spore bags that are found on the underside of the fern leaves. Each spore bag contains thousands of spores. When the spores are ripe, the spore bags will burst open and release spores into the air. The wind disperses the spores to other places. Lastly, let's take a look at mold. Mold can grow on various surfaces as long as there is enough moisture. The spore bags of mold are located at the top of their stalk. The mold can spread their spores by releasing them into the air.